So my name is Brady McCormick and I'm interviewing you for my Aging in Today's Society course at NKU. Got some questions I'm gonna ask you about your experiences and opinions living as an older adult. Um, it is being recorded by my phone there um, and it will be seen by my teacher and my classmates. Is that okay? Yes. Sweet. Um, could you please uh, introduce yourself, your first name, last name, and age, and how you know me? Uh, my name is Diane McCormick. I am 76 years old, and I am your grandmother. I thought you were 77. Not yet. Not till January. Gotcha. Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> um, what aspects of aging do you find most challenging? Probably memory. I don't have physical issues like a lot of people do, but probably my worst thing is memory. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of what I would expect. Maybe weakness. I mean, my muscles aren't as strong as I used to be that, you know, I, I poop out a little sooner than I used to. I'm not as strong. Yeah, you're still That's it. pretty mobile though. Yes, yes. It is not a serious issue, but there is some difference over the last... 10 or 15 years. Okay. Um, how has your cultural background and ethnic identity shaped your experience of aging? And are there particular traditions or values from your heritage that you find important as you grow older? Um, from my background, my family, my grandfather was a doctor. So we have always been fairly involved in eating healthy and a healthy lifestyle, which has probably led to the good health that I have at this day and age. Um, and on a religious or spiritual aspect, the older you get, the more you're concerned about your mortality and the more you're concerned about what happens after you die. That definitely is an impact, you know, as you get older. Um, other than that, I can't really think of much of anything. Do you think you've become more religious or less religious as you've gotten older? Abs the same? Absolutely more. More? Okay. Um, I know more. I, you know, you get more into it. You want to know more and try to understand more and read more. So in that respect, more religious, although I've always been a religious person by nature. Gotcha. Um... Can you share how, if you want, um, how you've experienced changes in your physical health, uh, mental health, and cognitive abilities as you've aged? Um, and if there is something dramatic that's changed, have you adapted to it, or do you like a workaround for it? Okay, so what aspects physical? I don't have any dramatic physical. I have osteoporosis, which is not surprising for a female at 76 years old. That's typical. I also had endometriosis surgery in my early 30s, which caused me to have a hysterectomy. So that's a lack of estrogen from that point. So it's sure. definitely osteoporosis in my case. Um, what else? Physical, mental. I don't really notice any great mental difference except um, the, co or the cognitive thing. I can still think as good and figure things out and understand. It's just that the memory, especially proper nouns, somehow people's names, I think, oh man, I should know them. Or that what's the name of that restaurant or this, you know, that is the biggest thing that you cannot remember. I know what I ate yesterday and what I ate today and I know who I am and where I live. It's not those kinds of things. Right. It's, it's typically proper nouns. Okay. I think that's... I don't remember those half the time, so I don't think that... <laughs> well, a lot of people don't sometimes. But, yeah. And maybe that's because you don't pay as much attention, maybe, but maybe not, I don't know. But all my friends this age have it, so I'm not at all really concerned about that. Yeah, maybe yeah, who really cares. Um, what strategies or resources have you found most effective in managing and financing your healthcare costs? Well, since I have very little health care costs because I am a healthy person, that's not a major issue for me. Every year I do look at all the options for Medicare and for the Plan B and take the one that I think suits me best, which in this case for me, at least at this point in my life, is the cheapest. 
Hell yeah. So that helps financially. For sure. Um, how have you approached advanced care planning and what factors have influenced your decisions about your future medical care and end of life preferences? So like nursing homes, yeah. hospice, DNR orders, right. anything like that. Um, Living will. Yes, whatever. I do have um, long-term health insurance, which means, you know, the kind that I can stay in my own house for a longer period of time because I can live on my first floor only and they will pay part of this cost to have somebody come in and maybe do laundry for me or clean my house or fix meals for me if necessary. Um, I do have a health plan to do that. What else was in there? Uh, medical care and end of life preferences. So like okay. hospice. That, right. Um, I do not have a living will. I will not have a living will because words change. The meanings of words change over time. Okay, the definition of laws and things change over time. Therefore, I will have a surrogate, a medical surrogate, that understands what my wishes would be, what I would like to have, and they can make any decisions for me if I am unable to make my own decisions. Because, so, if you know, the meanings of words change, and, you know, what is considered ordinary care, just like a feeding tube, used to be considered ordinary care to, get, to supply a person with food. Now they're calling that extraordinary care. Kind of is when you see it in real life. Well, so that's, and that's why, because you don't know what words are gonna change or how that's an example of how things can change. So I do not want to you know, put anything in black and white that would turn out going against what I would want. Yeah, nothing legally binding. Yes, yes. When you say sir, you mean specifically a surrogate, surrogate, or do you mean like a power of attorney or both? Um, a power of attorney, if I understand correctly, is only for financial. It's in, like legally, they like just can do anything for you. Well, like I guess of, I have a financial power of attorney, so that somebody can pay my bills or do whatever and look over things if I don't. Um, and I have appointed a surrogate. A okay. person just to make any medical decisions for me, whatever needs to be made. If if I can't make them myself, if I can make my own, I get to make my own. <clears throat> gotcha. And then somebody will step in if I'm in a coma or if I, you know, don't have the cognitive ability to understand. Then somebody else who knows my wishes, my desires, my philosophies to make those decisions for me. Who's your surrogate? Your mom. That's what I figured. It was Marcia, and I'm not. I was gonna, it yeah, might Marjorie. still be Marcia, technically. Now that is on paper. Right. You know, it might still, but I'm changing that to your mom because she was too young when I did that. Yeah. And I didn't, you know. Yeah. As I and I, and I have a backup. It used. To, I think it was Marcia with Maureen being the backup. Okay. Maureen right now is actually my uh, power or financial power of attorney because she's the youngest, you yeah. know, and your yeah. mother was too young at that point in time to, you know, do that. So I think right now, Marcia is the health surrogate and Maureen is the fin or the financial power of attorney. But they each have a backup in case they can't do it or they predecease me or they're in the same state that I'm in, whatever. Right. Do you guys all do that with each other? Mm-hmm. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, really most cool. of them have their husband. Typically, your husband, if you're married, your husband is automatically yeah. your power of attorney and your medical surrogate. Or vice versa. Yeah. yeah, your spouse, I should say. Yeah. Since I only have sisters, it would be husbands, but yes. But since I am do not have a husband, yeah. I need to appoint someone else to take that responsibility, if need be. That's cool, though. Um, so you should have one, too, really. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Well, you never know. You could be in a car wreck tomorrow, and yeah, true. I mean, would you want to be resuscitated? Would you not? I mean, who knows? I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not answer, right, asking right. you to answer that question, but it's something that, truthfully, anybody living on their own, you know, that's not legally bound to somebody, any adult, really should have one. Yeah, I put that in the 
likelihood is so low category, you can just ignore it <laughs> until the likelihood grows to where you should probably should address well, it. Well, at your age, I didn't pay of anything either, yeah, truthfully. Fine. But yeah. as you get older, you do think about these things because they come more real to you because you know people, you know friends, you know family, neighbors in these situations. Right. Um, what role do you think family and friends should play in caring for and supporting older adults? So that's more like vague, just society. I think family should step up and they should be first, especially children and grandchildren, but even siblings. I mean, you spend your life taking care of them when they're young. And I think they really have like a, almost a moral responsibility to care for you when you get older. You know, the tables turn. They become the adult and you become the child as you get older. And I think that they should be the primary ones where you can. Now, there are cases where that cannot happen. There are people so de that are demented that cannot take care of themselves. They need care 24-7. And a lot of people cannot do that on their own, especially if, if you have an older spouse. He cannot take care of you and go to the grocery. What's he going to do? I mean, you know, you have to have help, you know, and if it gets to a point where the family can't do it, which can realistically happen a lot of times, then sure. you have to go to some place where you can get 24-hour care. But I think families should step up and, you know, do the job first. And I think they owe it kind of to you because you took care of them. You did it for them when they were little and they needed care. Right. And I think that's only the right thing to do. I think that makes a, a ton of sense, but then like, because it is kind of a more broad, open-ended question, mm -hmm. I would say like, so like hypothetically, okay, what if there was, you know, like a, a grandson and like a grandmother, a grandfather, but they weren't on good terms, um, like just weren't fans of each other, right? and we're just even generally just in society, I know you're saying that from like your perspective, right. which makes a ton of sense. But there's a lot of people that don't have that. You still think they should? Um, I would like to say yes, although I understand for some people in some families and situations, it's utterly impossible. Okay, first of all, there can be distance. You know, you can't do it. And if you have, what if there was abuse? What if right. there was neglect earlier? Right. I mean, there are things like that to where it takes a pretty tremendous person to be able to step up and then care for somebody else. I think those are truly heroes, though, who's, who can do that. You know, I think it would be fantastic if they would, but I would never expect somebody like to do that. I think that's kind of above and beyond the call of duty, but that's what a hero is. Okay. Uh, what are some of the biggest differences you've noticed in how society treats older adults now versus how they were treated when you were younger? Um, I don't know that I think there's a dramatic difference except I think now it's very easy because everybody is so busy and so oriented to do, 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 and accomplish and get this stuff done that I think now people... Um, are much more likely to take their older family members and put them in a nursing home, put them in assisted living, put them in somewhere where they're taken care of, and I really don't have to worry about it a whole lot. Yeah. That is, I think, the biggest change that I have seen, that, you know, mom is in the nursing home, and, yeah, we'll go visit her once a month, but we don't have to worry about her because she's taken care of. And now I can do all the things I want to do. I can do my job and my family and my vacations and my my hobbies and everything and not have to worry about her. And I think even years and years and years ago, um, two and three generations lived in the same family. Yeah, same house. And stuff. Same, yeah, same, yeah, yeah. Very close or same house, certainly same city. And grandparents kind of watched grandkids and helped out the parents when they were young and the kids grew up and the kids were close to grandma and they took care of grandma or grandpa when they got older. It was a more the family was a tighter knit community than I think it is today because jobs are part of it. They transfer people here, there, you're across country. You can't, you know, in many cases, you can't do that. Yeah. But that's the biggest change I've seen is the split up of the family 
you know, that it's not the close think, community it used to be. Do you think part of that, do you think part of the reason that was a thing back then, the, more so out of necessity than idealized, where it's just cheaper um, to have one roof for more people? I think it just started out that way and nobody ever questioned it. It just kind of happened. As companies, after we had, you know, the industrial revolution and there were more jobs and more jobs and people started getting transfer and people started moving away, people made more money and they'd move over here and have their own house right. further away. I think it's just the way the culture developed more than anything specifically. Okay. Um, are there any changes or improvements you'd like to see in the way society society supports older adults? I would like to see them be kinder and more looking out for them, helping them more where possible. I mean, you know, and just stupid examples, Kroger's could have somebody that would carry their groceries to the car or put them in the trunk for them, especially if they have 24 bottles of water that are heavy, you know, or even just canned goods and stuff that, you know, and that's just a silly, stupid example, but just for little things like that. I think they could have people to help them with technology. Older people today have a lot of issues with technology. You know, they don't understand it. They're not used to it. They never did it, you know, and I think that there should be more ways to help. Help them with their credit cards at the thing or they're tapping them or their, their internet or their, you know, just paying bills online, you know, whatever, all of this that there should be more support somehow, some way, for that. Yeah, it's kind of just my opinion, but I think a lot like, you know, you were born in 46, right? 48. 48. Back then, as like a percentage of the population, people that were 65 and older is like, was way, way smaller. Less. Yes, so, yes, we are the baby boomers that after World War II, the, the babies boomed. Yeah, well, people are just... And, and now they're, they're, they're older people. They're yeah, the seniors. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and the birth rate is down. People are having less children. Right. You know, so, so they're not replacing the people that are older, so there's a much higher percentage of older people now right, than there were. That's kind of what I'm saying. Like, normally, you didn't live to 78 in 1945 because you would just die. Medicine, <laughs> med like, medicine wasn't as well, good. Well, that's it. Well, people didn't know as much about health or diet, and right. they didn't do the things about health, you right. know. And, yes, and people are also living longer today. Yeah, so I think... So um, it's compounded by both things, that, you know. Yeah, birth rates falling means that in the future right. there's less people. That was a, a big rise in the birth rate, who yeah. those people are now seniors, and they know better how to take care of themselves and we're not having as many children, so there are more older people now than probably there ever were, percentage-wise. Right, which I think is like a big difference. I don't know for sure, but I'd be willing to bet if I was like 15 years old in mm -hmm. like 1940, and there's like three old people on the street, it's probably a lot easier for everyone to come together to help those three people versus when it's like a quarter or like Probably a third true. of your Probably population. True. And that's what's going to happen with Social Security. I mean, if there's less people to work to put into the Social Security pot, right. and there's a whole bunch of old people taking out of the Social Security pot, right. that ain't going to work real well. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to have to be some adjustments. It's a lot easier to support. Yes, and it's that same thing. Yes, million. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and what advice would you give to younger people regarding aging and life? Stay active, stay healthy, stay in communication with other people. Don't be a hermit by yourself. People need people. No man is an island, that kind of thing, I think is very important. Um, keep your perspective right. Be positive. Hang around positive people because that helps you be positive. Um, for me, obviously, it's a big trust in God factor that, you know, Whatever's going on, he's got it under control. I don't know why he does what he does, but I think he's got it under control. But I think that you need to have a rock somehow, whatever your rock is, that keeps you positive, happy, outgoing, moving, not just sitting at couch all day and play on the internet or watch TV, 
you know, yeah. keep yourself busy and active, happy. Okay. Sweet. Is that it? Yeah.